So this is the last half of our last lecture in pharmacology. So I know we did talk about um, female sex hormones in <clears throat> the last lecture, but I just figured I would start here just as a review. So the female sex hormones, most specifically progesterone and estrogen, when patients are taking oral contraceptives with those hormones in them, they are at a higher risk of blood clots, especially if they're a smoker and over 35. And then gingiv gingivitis, <clears throat> an inflammation of the gingiva, and dry socket, which is after extraction. <coughs> and we also need to <coughs> realize that oral contraceptives effectiveness is reduced with antibiotics. So you will need to tell your patients if they have premedicated for a condition that requires it and they take oral contraceptives that they will need to use a secondary form of birth control for the remainder of the cycle. Osteoporosis is being treated with bisphosphonates, which could lead to the rare side effect of osteonecrosis of the jaw or osteonecrosis of the mandible. And you can see here this bony area that's been exposed, the gingiva is gone, the soft tissue, and you can see the bone. <clears throat> the osteoporosis treated with the injected or IV <clears throat> bisphosphonate, the reclast here, the dronate. So when you see dronate in a drug name, it indicates it's a bisphosphonate. And this doesn't have to do with hypercalcemia. We've talked about hypercalcemia being beneficial to patients with <clears throat> osteoporosis, with the thiazide diuretics. These have a different mechanism of action related to let me see, osteoclasts. So the dronates work in this specific way. And if patients are taking the IV, Reclassed, they're at a much higher incidence of developing the osteonecrosis of the jaw, the ONJ, but they can also get it <clears throat> from the oral. But it's still pretty rare that someone would develop this. And now we're going to talk about non infectious respiratory illnesses. So we know we have infectious respiratory illnesses where you're sick with like COVID 19 or coughing with a flu. And those would be considered infectious respiratory illnesses. But patients also have things that make them cough, affect their airway, their respiration, that are non-infectious. People can't catch it. So one of those is asthma. And asthma is a condition in where your airways narrow. And they also swell. So there's some bronchoconstriction and also edema from swelling. So not only are they getting more narrow from bronchoconstriction, but that narrowing also swells a little bit with, through edema, and you're also producing excess mucus. And it can make breathing difficult and trigger coughing, a whistling sound, which is wheezing, when you breathe out and shortness of breath. So for some patients, asthma is just a minor inconvenience. But for others, it could be a major problem that interferes with daily activities and may lead <coughs> to a life-threatening asthma attack. And so the airway obstruction itself, so the airway is being obstructed because the bronchioles are constricted and they're also swollen and they get clogged with um, mucus, it is reversible. And so asthma has at many causes. Sometimes it's an allergic reaction to a viral infection. Um, it can be also induced by airborne substances such as pollen or mold spores, particles of skin and dried saliva by pet hair, environmental contaminants such as workplace irritants, such as chemical fumes, gases, or dust. It can be brought on by emotional stress or exercise-induced asthma, which may be worse when air is cold and dry. So signs and symptoms of asthma is shortness of breath, 
wheezing or that whistling sound during exhalation. There is a medical emergency associated with asthma and it is called status asthmaticus. And this is where patients have a persistent, life-threatening bronchospasm, meaning the bronchial, they spasm, they constrict, they shrink down despite drug therapy. And the drug of choice for status asthmaticus is epinephrine, which you would deliver parenterally, intramuscularly. And the epinephrine, it helps to reverse the bronchoconstriction. Epinephrine is a sympathomimetic agent that creates bronchodilation. There are other non-infectious respiratory illnesses outside of asthma. We have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which is a chronic inflammatory lung disease that causes obstructed airflow from the lungs. Symptoms will include breathing difficulty, cough, mucus production, and wheezing. It's typically caused by a long-term exposure to irritating gases of particulate matter, most often from cigarette smoke. Patients with COPD are at increased risk of developing heart disease, lung cancer, and a variety of other conditions. So when you think of when you're breathing, air travels down your windpipe, which is your trachea, and into your lungs through the two large tubes, which are bronchi. Inside your lungs, these tubes divide many times, like the branches of a tree, into smaller tubes called bronchioles that end in clusters of tiny air sacs, which is your alveoli. The air sacs have very thin walls. They're like one cell width wide. So these thin walls are filled with tiny blood vessels called capillaries. And the oxygen in the air you breathe or inhale passes into these blood vessels and enters your bloodstream. At the same time, carbon dioxide, the gas that is the waste product of your metabolism, is exhaled. The lungs rely on the natural elasticity of the bronchial tubes and air sacs to force air out of your body. In COPD, the elasticity is lost and sometimes they even overexpand, they get like floppy, like kind of like an elastic band that's lost its elasticity which leaves air trapped in your lungs when you exhale. So this is an irreversible airway obstruction. COPD, there are two forms that we will look at, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Chronic bronchitis, this is when your bronchial tubes are inflamed. Itis means inflammation of, so it's inflammation of your bronchioles and they're also narrowed, and your lungs are producing more mucus, which further block the narrowed tubes. So the body will develop like a chronic cough, trying to clear your airways, trying to get the mucus out. Emphysema is a little different in that it (coughs) causes destruction of the fragile walls and elastic fibers of the alveoli. So the small airways collapse when you exhale. They don't bounce back and this impairs your airflow out of your lungs. So there are many agents that are used to treat these respiratory, these non-infectious respiratory agents. We have beta-2. So this is a selective drug. So it's a little different than our selective beta-1 that we've learned about, atenolol. Our selective beta-2 produces bronchodilation. This is something like albuterol. So these selective beta-2 agonists work primarily in the lungs to produce the bronchodilation. And they have fewer cardiac side effects. So these are sympathomimetic agents. And so if they were agonists in the cardiac region of our body, that could make your heart rate increase a positive chronotropic effect, or it could also create <clears throat> the force of contraction to be increased, which is a positive inotropic effect, but they don't because they're selective. So that's a good thing that they only work in the lungs for someone that's an asthmatic with cardiac disease. <clears throat>
in the agents that I want you to know for the final exam is albuterol. And you can see that these short-acting beta-2 agonists all end in OL. So think about asthma. So if it's OLOL, we're talking about cardiac drugs. But if it's just all, OL, we're talking about asthma or respiratory drugs. So albuterol is that meter dose inhaler. And that's the one I want you to use. It's the drug of choice for an acute asthmatic attack. So if someone begins to have an asthma attack in your chair, you will hand them or they will take their own meter dose inhaler, usually of albuterol, and it's useful for mild occasional asthma. We also have long-acting beta-2 agonists. So this wouldn't be for an acute attack. So it's not for the management of acute asthmatic attack because the onset is delayed, although the duration of action is sustained. This drug here, Cerevent, and we can see in the name, the trade name here, Vent. So if you see in the trade name Vent, think somehow ventilation, breathing, it has to do with airway. This drug has a black box warning. And it has this black box warning because it was found that when patients did have an asthma attack, they were more likely to be hospitalized and die from those attacks when they were taking Cerevent as an individual drug. We'll see in a few minutes that Cerevent is combined sometimes with corticosteroids. And when it's combined with corticosteroids, it doesn't have the black box, black, black box warning anymore <clears throat> because they didn't find that those patients that took the combination medicine didn't end up in the hospital or with life-threatening asthma attacks. And so we've talked about corticosteroids and the typical side effects seen with the corticosteroid therapy. So we looked at that, that Cushing syndrome, someone looking very cushiony, do not occur when the patient is taking the corticosteroid through inhalation, which is known as aerosol administ administration. You will usually take an inhaled corticosteroid if you're using your albuterol, your short-acting selective beta-2 agonist, more than three times a week. So you can see as we start to go down through these agents that the asthma is becoming less controlled, more likely to have a significant asthma attack. So you can use corticosteroid, they can inhale it, or they can also take the pill. Prednisone is usually. So if they take the oral administration of prednisone every day, they are going to get that cushion-like or cushionoid-like syndrome, the puffy cheeks, the buffalo hump that we talked about when we looked at our glucocorticoids. Now, if they inhale it, we talked about how the immune response is decreased when you take corticosteroids. When you inhale them, it creates like a mini immunosuppressant in the back of your throat. And when you suppress immunity in the back of your throat through prolonged inhalation, you can develop an opportunistic infection of candidiasis caused from candida albicans. The patient recognizes it as thrush. So to prevent the patient, if they are inhaling corticosteroids for a long time, your oral hygiene instruction to that patient will be for them to rinse their mouth with water. <coughs> Excuse me. They should rinse their mouth with water every time they inhale a corticosteroid. So here are some inhaled short-acting corticosteroids. 
And we can see, as we talked before <clears throat> last week, corticosteroids end in O-N-E. And so the one I want you to know here is flow vent. Oh look, vent again, so that's great. So that is fluconazone. I'm sure it's pronounced better than that. But we also have here, we talked about this drug, when used alone, has a black box warning. <clears throat> but when it's combined with this corticosteroid, it is safe to use, and that's Advair. And we can see Advair advancing the air, so that's good. The trade name, asthma court, you think about it's a corticosteroid for asthma. And Simba court, I see court here in the trade name. So these are inhaled. You will tell your patients if they use them, they should rinse their mouth with water to prevent <clears throat> candidiasis from forming. If they are taking the corticosteroid by pill every day, you may see some of that Cushing-like syndrome develop in your patients. Here are some other asthma management drugs. This one, chromalin, has been taken off the market. They don't have the correct kind of gas to deliver it through an inhaler anymore. Um, it used to be used in just prevention. Then we have leukotriene inhibitors, and our leukotrienes are very similar to like our histamines and bradykinins. <clears throat> they are chemical mediators of inflammation. So when you inhibit the leukotrienes, you're inhibiting chemical mediators of inflammation, blocking inflammation. Methyl, methyl xanthines is something like the lophalin. Another kind of xanthine that we know of is caffeine. Methyl xanthines are used much more rarely. There's better drugs, um, safer drugs. Methyl xanthines have a lot of side effects and can be dangerous on their own. So <clears throat> that would be a drug of like last resort. Anticholinergic agents. So we know if we looked at sympathomimetic drugs, anticholinergics or parasympatholytic drugs will work similarly. Again, another old school option. And sometimes anticholinergics were used if someone had cardiac issues because there'd be less cardiac events when you use anticholinergics. Monoclonal antibodies is a kind of antibody produced from a cell line by cloning a unique white blood cell. And all subsequent antibodies derived this way trace back to a unique parent cell. So most anti-asthmatic monoclonal antibodies block the activity of interleukin-5. A cytokine, another inflammatory chemical mediator of inflammation secreted by many types of cells. So usually monoclonal antibody drugs will end in M-A-B, MAB. And if you look at the name, sometimes you can figure out whether the cell line was derived from a mouse. If there's an I in the name, it's a mouse. If there's an A in the name, it's from a hamster. XI, I believe, means it comes from a human, so that's kind of interesting. So some of the dental implications of respiratory drugs. So we need to know that about 10% of the population, minimally 10%, has some form of pulmonary disease. So we should always be incorporating stress reduction protocol. <clears throat> and adrenal <coughs> supplementation should be instituted. So if they have met the rule of two, that they have taken more than 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone or its equivalent, which would be five milligrams of prednisone, for longer than two weeks within the last two years, you may need to supplement and give them more um, adrenal corticosteroid supplementation if the procedure they're going to have is going to produce severe stress. So usually that would be more for a surgical procedure, not a dental hygiene procedure. Right now we're gonna look at some GI disorders. So there are ulcers, and that's a hole in the mucus lining of the stomach, cre <clears throat> usually created by a bacteria, um, H. pylori. And then there is 
GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and that's when the stomach, the sphincter, right, like on top of your stomach, might be a little um, spastic, and it can not close all the way, and so the stomach contents flow back into the esophagus. And something that's interesting, just for your own knowledge, <clears throat> sometimes GERD actually creates like a pseudo asthma situation at night. So when you go flat on your back, the acid in your stomach, if you have GERD, comes up and it comes up into <clears throat> your esophagus. And the lungs will react by creating a bronchoconstriction because it doesn't want the acid to enter your airway. So everything sort of bronchoconstricts. So you will get coughing worse at night when you're flat on your back. You may think your asthma gets worse at night, but it has to do with your GERD. So sometimes now they're treating asthma, newly de <clears throat> developed asthma, especially ones that worsen at night with GERD drugs because they think it's because of the acid coming up close to the airway. So we've talked a lot about antihistamines related to allergies, but also there are histamine, they're called histamine 2, and that histamine 2, it creates acid in the stomach by the parietal cells. So when you block the histamine 2, you block the creation or the secretion of acid into the stomach. So that reduces the asthma release and they're useful in the treatment of both GERD and ulcers. But for your own knowledge, histamine 2 blockers, and you can see here that they end in tidine, T-I-D-I-N-E. That would indicate a histamine 2 blocker useful in GERD. But these drugs, a lot of them have a lot of side effects, and the proton pump inhibitors, the PPIs, are, have been more successful in limiting the amount of acid in the stomach. So these are used less <clears throat> frequently. And so the histamine 2 blockers also work a little bit in the brain, and they cause some adverse effects that you can see, such as slurring of speech, confusion, headache. And then cimetidine, which is tagamet, inhibits several. This one is probably the worst of the bunch for side effects, cimetidine. It inhibits several microsomial enzymes. So these agents will be slow to be cleared. So benzodiazepines, phenytoin, lidocaine that you may inject, and warfarin. So you can see how this would be dangerous. So a lot of elderly patients are taking these agents in addition to these other agents. So benzodiazepines, if they're not being cleared very quickly, the patient could be sedated for much longer, and that's when you see people like driving through their hairdresser's glass window and running into people because they're still under the influence of the benzodiazepines because they've combined them with something like Tagamet. The other thing that cimetidine does is it binds with androgens, and so we learned andro means masculinizing. So or specifically testosterone. So when cimetidine binds with testosterone, it is seen as a loss of secondary male characteristics. So our primary, <coughs> primary <coughs> sex characteristics, things like the penis and the vagina, secondary male characteristics, the secondary sex characteristics that cimetidine brings on the male is something called gynecomastia. And so when you, all right, let's break it down. Gyno means woman and mast means breast. It means the formation of breasts in males. And if you can believe it, they actually have asked this on a national board, which drug causes gynecomastia? And it is cimetidine.
and now our proton pump inhibitors. And the proton that we're talking about is hydrogen, H plus. It's a proton. So when the stomach is creating acid, the last step is those parietal cells that line our stomach is to exchange potassium ions for hydrogen. And then it liberates those ions into the stomach. Proton pump inhibitors stop this exchange from happening. They've proven to be very successful at reducing acid. So many more people will be taking PPIs versus <clears throat> histamine 2 blockers when they have GERD. And so our suffix for proton pump inhibitors is prazole. So we know azole is our antifungals. Prazole is our protein pump inhibitors except for the one exception here, which is eriprazole. And eriprazole is Abilify, which is an antipsychotic medication. So very common agents that you'll see patients taking. Antacid, so anti-acid of the stomach, <clears throat> it neutralizes the acids in the stomach by raising the pH through bivalent and trivalent ions like magnesium and aluminum. This is like Tums and Rolates the patients take. The one thing that you should be aware of is tetracycline, if taken in addition or in conjunction with antacids, forms a huge molecule in the stomach, unable to be absorbed into the systemic circulation. It, it completely makes the tetracycline inactive. You never can combine tetracycline with antacids. <clears throat> so when someone has an ulcer, they'll usually use mixed agents for treatment. So they'll do an acid reducer, an H2 block or a PPI, and probably most likely a PPI, and then a bismuth subsilate, peptobismol may be used. And newer combinations often also use one antibiotic like clarithromycin. <laughs> <clears throat> inflammatory bowel disease. So the exact cause of this disease remains unknown. Previously, diet and stress were suspected, but now doctors know that these factors may aggravate IBD but aren't the cause. So one cause is a potential immune system malfunction, like an autoimmune disease. When your <clears throat> immune system tries to fight off an invading virus or bacterium, an atypical immune response causes the immune system sometimes to attack the cells in our di digestive tract too. There are also several gene mutations that have been associated with IBD, so hereditary does seem to play a role in IBD. It's more common in people who have family members with the disease. So ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease share some similar symptoms. And they are both a type of inflammatory bowel disease, but they're not the same illness, and they affect different areas of the GI tract. The ulcerative colitis is only the colon. So we see that in inflammation, itis, col, colon, inflammation of the colon and rectum, also known as the large intestine. And it affects only the innermost lining of the large intestine. Crohn's disease can impact any part of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus, even though the colon is the most commonly affected. And it can affect the entire thickness of the bile wall. So there are many agents used to treat chronic inflammatory bowel disease, and it sometimes depends on just what your symptoms are, because you could be primarily diarrhea, primarily constipation, or a mix. You could have a lot of abdominal pain. And for anyone here who's had diarrhea with pain, it can be very painful. So sometimes they're treated with anti-diarrheal agents, things like Imodium, antispasmodics for acute attacks of abdominal pain. That could be the, let's see, Lamotil, we talked about a long time ago, which is a Schedule Five drug, and we know that our opioid analgesics all cause constipation that never goes away. 
And so one of those agents called Lomotil Lomotion is, treat, is useful in treating diarrhea and also the pain. And then we have serotonin modulators, right? Most of our serotonin is not in our brain. It's actually in our guts. And <clears throat> sometimes like with your brain, you might want more serotonin, but in your gut, you might want less. And those are things like Zofran is also really great at controlling nausea and vomiting. And those end in the suffix Citron, S-E-T-R-O-N. So other drugs that are useful in treating GI disorders, sometimes they might use prednisone, right? Because if it's an autoimmune disorder, things like prednisone can limit the immune response. They can use something called an immune modifier, such as cyclosporin. And cyclosporin and cyclosporin's <clears throat> trade name is Sandimmune. And that is our last drug that causes gingival hypoplasia. And an antibiotic that they use to treat it is Flagyl. And our last slide of pharmacology is this person with gingival hypoplasia caused from cyclosporin. In this case, it's tacrolimus is an, another trade name for this drug. And we can see, again, not as significant as with Dilantin. But still, it's probably Dilantin's the worst, then Cyclosporin's probably second, and then our calcium channel blocker tends to just be in the papilla.